Oh, hello. Um, thank you very much for having me today. Um, and thank you for the shout outs to Kantar. Uh, I am Whoa. Ann Hunter from Kantar. And here to talk a little bit about attribution and what we're doing with attribution in order to drive revenue, but in a very different way. How attribution can be used in a unique way that's not just about sales attribution, but about growing brands. A little earlier, we heard a great story about Eve. Eve being able to um, make decisions that are very price-driven and not all that related to brands. So actually, we see that and we know that from our overall use of advertising, that if you invest money in advertising or invest money in promotion, sales go up. And if you stop doing that, sales go down. So, pretty well understood, and, and there's a fear that in, in the future, something like Eve might make this our world, that you have to just keep investing and investing and investing in order to get any sales, and that there's no value to brands. But thankfully, we know that there's another artificial assistant that has actually proven that that story isn't true, that in fact, People are not going to entirely give up everything to a sales-driven world, and they will care about brand and experience. And that artificial assistant is named Betty, Betty Crocker. <laughs> <laughs> Betty Crocker, the brand, in the early 20th century made instant cake mix. Back before that, you had to put flour and baking powder, baking soda, people who know the difference of those, you had to actually understand that stuff. You had to put it all together and you make a cake. And so they put out this instant cake mix, had powdered eggs in it, powdered milk. All you had to do was add water. And it's like, oh, it's gonna be great, save all this time, women are gonna love this, making cake fast, and it didn't sell. It was too easy. There was no experience, there was no personalization. So they reformulated it and they took out that powdered egg and they issued it again and said, add one egg. And all of a sudden, the instant cake mix that you all use was born. There is something about brand that adds value. And we know that as automated things become, there's still going to be a role for building great experiences. And we know, based on the work of Binet and Fields, that brand, when you build dollars, build brand, the dollars grow, not just because they have immediate sales, but because they build predisposed customers who are ready for the next promotional dollar that you spend in advertising. And it's not just theoretical. In fact, our data shows this. We looked at the top most powerful brands and tracked their performance in the market since 2006, and found that the 10 most powerful brands, not companies, not biggest companies, not most employees, just the value and strength of their brand based on brand equity, are delivering 317% returns in the market. That brand itself delivers value. And so as automated as things become, brand is still valuable. The challenge is, how do we actually take advantage of automation and still get that awesome financial brand building power to grow business. Well, we talked to a bunch of marketers <coughs> and we asked them, you know, what's important to you? What, do you? what do you really need to do in your business to grow? And they came back and they said, I need to measure ROI or I'm gonna get fired. It was not, I need to grow my brand and get that 317% art return for my shareholders over a 15 year period. They said, I need to show this quarter how the money that I'm spending in advertising is delivering ROI. And that was the number one way that marketers were being judged. So they knew that they had to do that measuring ROI piece. And they said, I know that measuring the short and long term are important. About 70% of them understood that. They said, I'm being measured on the proving ROI, but actually, I know that I really need to do both. And there's a gap. There's a big gap between knowing that they need to do balanced, at, they need to balance short and long term investment and actually being able to do it. Only about half 
of marketers are saying, I can actually do this. I can balance the short and long term in a way that, could frankly, help them keep their jobs. CMOs got a high turnover rate. So we looked at this and we said, well, why not? You know this is what you need to do. You need to have balance between short term and brand in your advertising initiatives. Why aren't you doing it? Silos. Very clearly, it was the silos. We heard earlier today about the data lake at Coca-Cola. That was really exciting. Um, lots and lots of data integrations. Those are great, but they're saying it's still not actionable enough. Even when we try to bring that data together, we're not able to make it very actionable, particularly when it comes to brand. And that's because most of the data that is actionable is linked to sales. <coughs> Only 23% of people that we have asked in our Getting Media Right study are able to understand and integrate brand data and sales data together. Because sales data comes in all the time. We've been talking about it, linking it up at Experian. You can take all of that great behavioral data. You can link all that together. It's coming in all the time. You can run analysis on it. That's great. And so people are using that, but they know that that's going to be delivering more short-term return. How do you take the speed, the granularity that we can get from looking at sales data and apply that to actually building lasting brands that have value in the market? That's the big question. How do we use attribution to help short-term sales and long-term brand building? And I'll give you, give you an example. So we've been working with the New York Times, and uh, they've allowed us to present this, that they had an issue. The New York Times is a newspaper. We heard earlier someone say, who, watches, who listens to newspapers or reads newspapers? Um, and they have a perception that is associated with a print publication. It's associated with a certain type of journalism that is older. And they recognize they need to change that brand and make it relevant to millennials. At the same time, they need to fund all the journalists. And so they need to sell subscriptions. So how do you both move that brand perception as well as maintain subscriptions? We've worked with them and looked at a few questions and said, what is the right moment for them to advertise to get new subscribers and to build that brand? What is the right target that they should actually be reaching? What is the right message? And what is the right channel? Questions that every single one of you ask every day. But we looked at a different approach to answering them. We said, how can we take the analytics that we use with behavioral data and sales data and merge that with our traditional brand data, with brand equity data, and apply that same level of analytical rigor and attribution model to brand, mixing brand and sales. And we applied this and used AI to deliver the results and insights. The biggest insight that we were not expecting was that, in fact, the brand campaigns they were running and the direct response campaigns, you know, subscribe now for this great rate, should be separated. Traditionally, we think that the more touch points, the more overlap you have, the better. The stronger the message integrates into your mind. That's a sort of baseline assumption that we make. But what we learned when we did this is that there were people who were getting this way too much. They were part of the brand campaign. They're part of the DR campaign. And in fact, we were confusing the message. And we're getting oversaturated. They're like, New York Times, all right, enough. I get it. And that was because the brand and sales initiatives were integrated, that we learned that and learned where that intersection of increased frequency was occurring. We then used the algorithm to develop a prediction. What should be done? And we said, all right, the machine said, lower the frequency. That's just waste. That's going to save you money. You get a less cost per person. That'll actually increase the lift. It's going to increase your revenue. It's going to reach more people. And ultimately, you'll have twice as high affinity to the New York Times overall. So this was what the system recommended when we brought that data together. It also said, you need to change who you're targeting. 38% being spent on target A, and you know, that's got to decline. 
see, you're only seven, 17 percent, you got to up that. It made some very specific recommendations as to what needed to be done to change both the sales and the brand equity increases. And these changes were not necessarily intuitive. In fact, when we asked marketers in general what they think should be done in terms of measuring brand and measuring sales, they very often say, my TV <coughs> ads are for branding, my digital ads are for sales and performance. And there's like this general assumption that we should just go forward with that model, it's the easiest model. That's what we found in fact, <coughs> across the board, people are saying TV for branding, digital for sales. And when we look at it, actually on um, the results, we find something quite different. So we took all of our clients and we wanted to see, is that true? Should we make that assumption or should we let the computer make an assumption? We found that when we actually looked at the actual results, TV did a phenomenal job of delivering short-term sales, but not because it was actually driving sales, but because it was driving predisposition that then got activated with, digital with a digital close to the sale. The two worked really, really well in concert when they were the same messaging that predisposed and then hit them with the offer to close. And digital worked the opposite way. Great ROI short term, but really that was because TV boosted into that. So we found that in certain circumstances, you want to separate the campaigns. In other circumstances, you want to overlay the campaigns if the messages are actually intended to be sequential. And in the case of the New York Times, we found that display, even though the assumption was that display was going to be better at driving short-term sales, display was actually better at driving affinity or equity lift. And TV or video did poorly, but that was because of cost. Video and TV was so much more expensive that while it, the performance was great, the cost ultimately means that it's not the most productive solution. So you can see there's a variety of different ways of looking at this and adding in the granularity of being able to look at a very specific target audience, a very specific platform, and applying that not just to sales but to equity allows us to develop a model that can drive significant variance in the existing outputs to what we're getting today. So if we look again at the database and say, how do we look at if we look at these things combined, what are the results of all of our clients? We see that in fact TV and digital both perform really well. Print struggles just across the board, except for some very specific audiences. They both perform very well, but for different reasons, because of how they work in combination with each other. And if we look at what that meant for the New York Times, it meant that in phase one of our program with them, they were getting pretty good results. And we said, oh, can you make some of these changes that the machine is predicting? And I said, all right, we'll make some changes. So we saw in phase two, that the brand value increased. And then for phase three, they went all in. They said, okay, we see all the changes that this attribution model is actually recommending. We're gonna go make those changes at a large scale. And in fact, the results were a little more than double. And the machine had predicted that if they make those changes, they would get double. So we have a little bit of a pessimistic machine. <laughs> Uh, but this is the type of thing that can be done to raise both equity and sales. Now, New York Times isn't the only company that's thinking like this. Um, a lot of companies are now starting to think, how can I apply the analytics that I think of when I think of digital and think of sales to brand? eBay made some major changes to their ad spending, they previously had been spending primarily on performance, they've now moved to really spending on brand as well because they recognize that underlying brand value. But eBay is a smart digital company, so they are doing it using the digital techniques in their brand building objective. Similarly, Adidas. Adidas thought that their performance advertising was driving e-commerce. They thought if you're buying it online, it's because you saw an ad for it online and Thus, you wanted a great brand. You're, you wanted a great product. In fact, it's that brand advertising. If any of you have 13-year-old children, they're probably wearing an Adidas product right now. It's that 
um, advertising that was making it cool, making it hip, making it valuable that was driving e-commerce. And the promotions had very little to do with it. So Adidas has made some major changes to their spend as a result. Unfortunately, there are some companies that have not taken this approach. They've really doubled down on just focusing on that short-term ROI and not in understanding and investing in brand, probably because they're not using the techniques like attribution and applying it to their brand that can actually grow for them. So we have a client that's um, in the luxury space. And in the beginning, they were doing you know, maybe like a third of their business was performance in terms of their ad spend. And then they increased it to the majority of their ad spend being focused on performance because they had to sell. They, you know, things aren't going well. Let's just get sales. Let's get sales. And over the same period, sales dropped. So more discounts, more trying to get you know, into the recommendation. There's a degree to which that's important, but at the expense of building brand, an expense of using the techniques that we have to build sales actually decreases the overall value of the company. So when companies do this, and they find that right balance, they use the technology for both brand and sales combined, they have a huge opportunity to grow. We looked over almost 4,000 brands in our Brandsy database, and we found that brands that actually balanced performance and brand advertising in the right mix overall increased 46% in terms of value compared to the overall 4,000 set of brands. It's a huge opportunity for the overall growth of the business by being able to take these techniques that we have in analytics and in digital and applying them to brand measurement. So in conclusion, the word is balance. It's taking what we know how to do and get that granularity and using it to apply to the overall sea that lifts the boat of value for a company. It's brand being the driver of sales. People think of brand as being the long-term value, but it is the driver of sales today because of the predisposition it creates as well as sales tomorrow. It's measuring <coughs> brand and sales in silo misdirecting results. Being able to put them together to make decisions allows for stronger ultimate return. And using attribution to get the best of digital sales management and apply it to brand to grow the value of the company overall. And with that, time for questions. Great. showing the example of the, of the feeling New York Times, but uh, in companies where <laughs> in, 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 that's why I said I'll leave that to someone else to, <laughs> to say uh, but in, in companies where uh, mixed modeling and multi-touch attribution are sort of the, the key sources, right, and they by just their construction they are focusing on short-term sales how does this approach sync up with mm -hmm. approaches like mixed modeling and MTA? Because to my CMO, if I would go and say, hey, you know what, we need to do this, the answer would be, but mixed modeling tells us to do this, right? So it, how does it line up or sync up so that we can provide a holistic source of truth and say, here is the impact of these, these media messaging or channels on short-term sales, but here is how it impa impacts brand and has an impact on longer term sales. Yeah, absolutely. A uh, great question. So imagine, or think about it like this. Imagine you've got a GPS, and the GPS is telling you that you need to get from New York to Athens. Um, if your GPS just told you to head south, you might end up here, or you might end up at the University of Florida, and that wouldn't be as much fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> There's a, there's a sort of broad direction that's correct that we get from market mix modeling. And especially when you're looking at major million dollar allocations, 
on an annual basis, doing things like buying upfronts, where you have to make a decision with a whole lot of money on an annual basis, market mix modeling does a great job at that. It, it gives you that overall direction, and there are some decisions that can't be made in the, in the moment. So market mix modeling has absolute value. But attribution brings in the ability to fine tune that. Attribution gives us the ability to say, okay, turn right here, turn down this street, turn down that street. It gives us the ability to actually get much, much closer to where we ultimately want to go in the moment, and we can do both. You, you sort of want to have both because, quite frankly, the cycle of ad spending has different rhythms. It has an annual rhythm that is really based on traditional video upfront buys, and then it has a instantaneous rhythm that's based on programmatic and being able to reach addressable audiences through DSPs, DMPs, um, which will start to creep into television as we see addressable television increasing as well. So I think businesses that are smart are going to look at this and say, I, if I'm not bringing market mix modeling and attribution together into a unified framework, I may be behind as the market moves more toward an addressable television, addressable video future. Okay. Um, I, just, I thought New York Times was a very interesting example too because they are a brand that is under attack. And so is there, do you recommend different strategies for that? Is, it, is that sort of something that passes with time or to say, hey, you're under attack, spend even more on brand now? I am not going to try to address how to um, battle an attack from the attack that is occurring um, against the New York Times right now. I think that there's uh, about like 15 candidates running for office that are probably trying to figure that challenge out. Um, what I would say is that you know, we've we got to let the, the data tell us what to do, right? So it, it may be that that is just another brand challenge that another brand may be in another competitive space. You know, it could be a CPG brand. It's just in a competitive space. It's to some degree similar and some degree not that similar from any other brand challenge. And the data is showing us, you know, make these modifications. The nice thing is because we're using attribution, data is coming in continuously. So all of the uh, digital data is tagged. It's all coming in. That data is coming in continuously, the, the results in terms of sales and the results in terms of brand, but also the television data because we're getting passive TV data from the passive TV data providers. So that data is coming in. So as sort of there's uh, market activities occurring that, that may be impacting a brand like the New York Times, it can be very reactive to it. The model can actually react, react and adapt in a way that you know, a market mix model can't because it is planning on a much longer time frame. Any other questions? Great. Thank you.